Okay, just uh, before we start today's video, I thought I'd give a quick little hello to Athanasios, or you may know him as Noseman. He's recently started a YouTube channel where he's going to be doing loads of tutorials, giving them away for free, uh, and they're not bad. So if you actually, if you like my videos, he's not a million miles different from me. So go give him a look. Uh, here's the link to his channel, and I'll stick this up again at the end. But uh, yeah, go have a look at his Noseman Nose channel and see what you think. But yeah, I quite like his stuff, so go, go check him out. Anyway, on to today's video. Okay, so I received an email uh, today, and it's from Philip Davies at Battle Cat Studios, and he's basically asking a question. Uh, this is a guy I've done some stuff with before. Um, he's essentially asking, what's the best way to bring some images into cinema for a shader effector? And the other thing he's asking about is how to get a clone to change color once it reaches a certain place. So essentially he's he's got this grid of objects all jumping up and down and when they reach a certain height he wants them to light up, change their materials and then revert back when they go back down. So let's just handle the first part of this first then. Regarding file formats, um, if you're using the latest version of Cinema from 19 and up, uh, you've got the ability to load in uh, newer and better file formats. Um, you can now load MP4 movies, that is one choice. Uh, if you've got an older version of Cinema though, you can load in QuickTime movies, although that's kind of being removed because it's a bit of a dead format. In terms of what the best format is though, I would generally suggest go for image sequences. The first reason for this is to do with how quickly you can distribute and read that data. So imagine you're rendering over Team Render or you're using an online render farm. If you're using a big, let's say, one gigabyte movie file as a texture, that means every render node, every render machine needs a copy of that texture. So you're having to send this massive giant file to all your machines before the rendering can start. If on the other hand, you go for an image sequence, well, Cinema can be a bit more intelligent about it. It only needs to send the small single frame of data to each render machine. So first of all, that does help in that area. The second reason though, or the second thing you can look at is how these files are read. Now, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of temporal video compression in a video like this, but I'll just shorten it down and say, it's a lot faster for software to read in one single file for a frame of data than it is to have to go spelunking through this giant one gigabyte video file trying to pull out the frame that it needs. That's just a lot more work and it can potentially slow the rendering down. And it will certainly slow your, your real-time editor down so, quite a bit. So my general advice is go for an image sequence of JPEGs. The file size is quite small. If you crank the quality up to sort of 95, 100%, then the image loss is gonna be virtually negligible. Um, if not, if you need perfection, a PNG sequence is not a bad choice either. Uh, yeah, so basically that, go for an image sequence. Um, on to the second part though, how can we get these cubes jumping up and down to light up? Well, let's, uh, let's try and recreate something, shall we? Let's grab a cube. Let's shrink it down quite a bit, because we always have to do this with MoGraph. And let's clone it up with a cloner. So we'll just go for a simple grid of objects. Maybe, let's see, cloner, let's set it to a grid. And we'll make this grid perhaps just 10 by one deep by 10 wide. So we're gonna end up with this 3D flat grid. Now. In this particular case, Philip is driving his animation with a video file to make these things go up and down. Uh, we're not too fussed about that though for the second part of the question. So all I'm gonna do is throw in a random effect. I will set this random mode to noise because this will sort of self animate. And under parameters, we'll say, look, don't move left and right. Don't move backwards and forwards just move up and down, and let's uh, exaggerate that quite a bit. Uh, we'll slow down the animation a little bit because this is quite frantic, so animation speed, let's just go 20%. Okay, perfect. So we've got these objects moving up and down, and we want to get them lighting up and changing materials as they reach a certain height. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna delve in and look at Cinema's uh, MoGraph color system. 
Now, I definitely find that this is something quite a few people have sort of skipped over and ignored. They're you're generally quite happy sort of moving things and scaling them and rotating them, but often this color system gets sort of ignored because people tend to think, oh, it just sort of randomizes colors and, you know, I don't particularly want that. But let's see what it really does. So what you can do is you can assign a color, or in this case, just a, a brightness to each object. So this here, this is my random movement. So let's just stick a name on the end of there. So know what this does. Uh, let's say I am also randomizing the color. And because I'm British, there is definitely a U. Um, let's say I'm gonna use this thing to randomize the color. If I give a look at my cloner, I've got this uh, movement effect there, and I've got this color effect here. So for the color one, I'm gonna say, look, don't, don't move it, don't scale it, don't rotate it. Instead, I want to affect the color. And if we just turn this on, everything takes on a random color. So this is the kind of thing where it's quite easy to look at and think, well, you know, I don't really want this random rainbow, so I'm not gonna use that feature. But here's the thing, you can define colors. So let's say we don't use the random effect. Let's say I pick my cloner and I choose a plane effect. Now the plane effect usually just applies the same value to everything. So if we look at the position, it just moves everything or it scales everything. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set it to set all the colors down to a user defined color. And that color is simply gonna be black. So we need to do this because you have to set your start color so that when we use the proper feature we're, that we're about to use, we can then make it turn into a color. If I don't use this, everything starts off as sort of virtually white, and if I'm trying to make something light up and get brighter, well, it's hard to do that if we're already starting off with everything being white. So I'm using this first plane effect to set everything to a user-defined color, which is black. So let's just name this something appropriate. So this is our plane effect, but it's uh, setting everything to black. It's the Amy Winehouse effector. Hey. Okay, so that's our starting point. And now we're now gonna add another one, another plane effect. But this one is going to set everything to white. Uh, so come down to the settings, turn off the position thing, that's always on by default. And we'll say once again, color, user defined, white. There you go, that's the default. So we've set them to black. Now we've set them to white. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify this by using some fall off. Fall off allows you to fade an effect out. It's one of the most powerful, useful, controllable bits in MoGraph. So currently the white is infinitely large. If we set this to linear, we now get this border where one side is white, one side is black, and there's actually a sort of fade through gray in the middle. If I move this thing up, this is where the fading happens. So that's the white, that's the black, and then in between the two, this is the fading. So you can actually sort of spread this out to get a longer gradient, or you can squash it down to get a much harsher sudden change. So if I take this, I don't want it to go sideways, I'll just rotate it around, do, 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 90 degrees, hold shift and it will snap. Okay, so I can now move this down and I've now got this sort of gradient, this uh, fading effect. So what we're gonna do is linger this near the top, squash it down as much or as little as I feel like, and I've now got basically an area where anything which goes past this red line will suddenly turn white. So when we press play and we leave our random effect, churning through. There we go. We now have the ability to make everything turn white as it jumps up to a certain height. Now, this is one part of the equation, making an object turn black and white. Okay, cool. This is really just the, uh, the data side of things. This is not what we actually want things to look like. We probably don't want pitch black cubes and pure white cubes. But the idea is you combine this MoGraph color with a special material, or rather a special shader in a material. If I create a new material, 
Uh, you can basically put in whatever you like. So for the color, you can throw in textures, videos, colors, wh whatever you feel like. Maybe I'll just set this to a sort of a, a dark, deep green color, sort of a mossy green. And we can throw this onto the cloner. Okay, and what do we want the black and white to do? Well, I want it to make objects light up. So under luminance, turn this on. Immediately that makes everything bright, but don't worry. We'll go to our shader pull down menu and we'll go to the MoGraph shaders. So what we'll use in here is the MoGraph color shader. This will extract the color that we set on the object and it will insert it into the material. So this is now only going to affect the luminance of the object. When I press play here, we have all these nice matte green cubes down there and only the ones which get past this section, this color shader will extract the color and insert it into the color settings for us. So uh, there we go, that's, that's what you can do with this. It will probably look quite nice if we uh, turn on a bit of global illumination, get to a nice frame in our render settings, add a bit of global illumination in. For a quick preset, go for the one called High Diffuse Depth. That's a nice starting point. And there we go. When we hit render, all these cubes hopefully will light up all the green ones. Feel free to boost the strength and have a play around with the settings. So uh, under illumination on this material, we can say, look, the, the global illumination being generated. Let's, uh, let's just double this up, make it twice as strong. So there we are. Now we have these cubes shining down and they are actually going to illuminate the rest of the project, which is quite nice. And they'll sort of turn on and off as this animation plays back. So if I, if I grab a different frame, when we get some different things lit up, let's say these ones here, then hopefully, ba -ba -bum, there we go. Nicely lighting up our scene. So there we go. That's how you can quickly and simply use the uh, plane effect to set a color and get it to light things up. Uh, I will just throw in a couple of other little bits here, just a little bit of troubleshooting, because I, I know where this tends to go wrong. I know sort of where people trip over. Um, the biggest mistake people tend to make with this is not getting the order in the cloner right. So which order I have these objects in my object list is completely inconsequential. It simply doesn't matter. What you've got to make sure you do, though, is down in your cloner, under effects, this is the order which matters hugely. Um, the position doesn't matter too much. What's important is the black and the white. We have to set this thing to everything black first, so sort of set the base palette, if you like, and then the white things will happen afterwards. So we then put a coat of white after they've been painted black. If I get this order wrong, it all suddenly stops working. So if you're working through this and it doesn't work, first of all, check that all three of these effects are actually in your cloner's effectors and make sure that the last thing which happens, top to bottom, is that they get set to white. Okay, there we go. Hopefully uh, that's been useful. Hopefully that will help a few of you. Thank you to Philip Davies for letting me use him as an example. Maybe go visit his uh, website or hire him for some work. That's uh, Battlecat Studios. Uh, anyway, that's all from me today. So this is Mash from 3D Fluff saying goodbye once again until the next video. If you do have a question yourself, if there's something which has been annoying you or you'd just like some advice on how to do something uh, better or faster or anything else, do drop me a mail, uh, mash at 3dfluff.com and maybe I'll do a video on how to help you.